Hey everybody, I'm Chuck, this is Jason, and guess what? Bookends is back. Uh, a couple of weeks ago was the NFL draft, and that was a lot of fun, and now the NFL schedule show is being released. It's being recorded a little bit before, so we've got a few leaks, a few tidbits, some of our insight. So we're going to jump right in it, Jay, and have some fun. I mean, Thursday night football, opening Thursday night, kicks off the season. The Super Bowl champ, Kansas City Chiefs are at home in Arrowhead. And who are they playing but the Detroit Lions? What's unique about that is last year, only one team was shut out of primetime games when the original schedule came out, and that was the Detroit Lions. You know, they did get a game. They do play on Thanksgiving, and they did get Week 18 flexed against the Green Bay Packers. But when the actual schedule came out, it meant the Bears, the Colts, the Jags, the Panthers, the Falcons, all teams that weren't projected to be very good all had primetime games, except the Detroit Lions. Now? Well, for, for a long, long time, people have been making a lot of money betting against the Detroit Lions, <laughs> betting against the Detroit Lions specifically on Thanksgiving Day. And last year, it looked like it was going to be a lot of the same. They started the season 1-6, and six, looking like the Detroit Lions that we know and love. Um, and then they ended on an incredible run. <laughs> Why do we love them? We're rooting well, yeah, against we don't them, love them but as a Bear fan, we like them, them, we like them losing. They ended the season on eight and two run, just missing out on, on getting to the playoffs with the right. Packers um, winning that final season. And now, believe it or not, they're now the favorite with the departure of Aaron Rodgers from the division. Um, and what's kind of going on in Minnesota with a lot of question marks, the Lions have moved to the favorite in the NFC North. Wait, can, and you, wait, can you say that the again? The Lions are the favorite oh in the God. NFC North. And now when you have all this hype surrounding you and you're, you're doing things, you're making picks, and now you get sent on opening day to play the Kansas City Chiefs, you're going to see what it's like uh, to move up into this kind of primetime status. We'll get to see the Chiefs raise their big Super Bowl banner. Um, we'll see if the Lions, if the hype is real, and this Lions team can really play with these guys. Um, I really like what they've done in the offseason. Um, obviously losing Jamal Williams, their 17 touchdown guy to the Saints this offseason. Um, DeAndre Swift, the running back that had been there for several years, gets traded to the Eagles. They pick up Jamar Gibbs uh, from Alabama. They pick up David Montgomery. Wait a minute. From I don't want to talk about Jamar Gibbs because that was a bad draft prop for us over under one and a half running backs. The fact that he went 12 was probably the biggest upset in the first round, but you're right. They do add Montgomery they, and Gibbs. They've got some pieces in Gibbs and Montgomery. Right. Now they do have a question mark with suspensions. Uh, Jamison Williams, their young receiver, um, most likely going to be suspended for six games, um, but the Lions do have the tools. They've got all the skill set now. Opening day at Kansas City is a whole nother story um, as long as Patrick Mahomes and Travis Kelsey are on the Chiefs. They've got a lot of question marks at wide receiver, but when you've got Mahomes and Kelsey, uh, the Chiefs are always going to find themselves well, in a good spot i agree with you i mean I, I like detroit too i love dan campbell he's like kind of a throwback type coach he reminds me of kind of today's mike ditka just the way he is on the sideline and he's animated and the way he is with his players but you know you look at detroit last year and i think they kind of caught people by surprise i don't think anybody really expected them to be that good when you looked at our future book board they were close to the bottom now though the expectations are sky high you're expected to win the north you're sent to Kansas City opening Thursday night. So let's see how a kind of a fairly young team that has had a uh, – they've drafted some players, they've signed some players via free agency, how they kind of respond now in that role – is being expected to win. Yeah, and they'll, they'll be catching a touchdown, if not a little bit more than the Probably touchdown a bit more. In, this, in this opening game. So uh, a tough spot for Detroit, but we are looking for big things from Detroit this season. Now, another game just on Sunday, week one, and, you know, I'm sure he would have looked into the camera at some point and said, I own you, but he's not in Green Bay anymore. So it's the Jordan Love era. And the Green Bay Packers get to start the season in Chicago in a late afternoon game on Sunday. So, I mean, it's, I think, you know, the Bears have done a lot in the offseason, too. They made that big blockbuster trade to get D.J. Moore. They've drafted, I thought, really well. Made some big linebacker signings in the offseason. And let's see what the Packers are right now um, against the Bears. I think one interesting tidbit, though, Jay, is that when you look at the Packers' win total now, it is a full two games below what the Jets' win total is without Aaron Rodgers. So you kind of see what the impact of number 12 is to your team. 
Yeah, and I'll start with the Packers here. Obviously, the departure of Aaron Rodgers and the departure of, of a lot of their receiving core and tight end. The Packers had a, a kind of mass exodus from their from their passing game. So Jordan Love steps in 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 a really tough role. I think that the Packers are going to be an Aaron Jones, AJ Dillon right. turn around and, and pound the rock because his receivers are Christian Watson, Romeo Dobbs, uh, Jaden Reed, tight end Luke Musgrove. They these aren't guys. Up. These aren't guys that are lighting up any fantasy boards to, right. be, to be drafted early. So the Packers are going to have to do it, and Jordan Love doesn't have a lot of the tools around him. So I think to put high expectations on Jordan Love to have big, big numbers as a Packer fan or just as a Jordan Love fan is not going to be there just because I don't think he has the tool set around him. On the opposite side of things for the Bears, there's a lot of hype about Justin Fields and what he can do in this third season. Kind of the same way that we looked at Jalen Hurts last year with getting a, a big wide receiver in A.J. Brown to come there and being able to do things in the running game with his legs. Um, the Bears were dead last in passing offense last year, but they were number one in rushing offense because Justin Fields was able to rush for 76 yards a game. That M- that MVP hype is is a little bit high for me coming from you know a four-win right. Bear team, but the expectations on what this offense can do with getting the linemen to secure things up, having this offense that can run the football, and now you talk about it DJ Moore Claypool Mooney Komet they get Tanyan uh, opposite of Jordan Love Justin Fields has the weapons around him um, to be able to do some things on offense and the Bears are going to have to do things on offense because their defense still isn't going to be able to stop a lot of young kids you know I think uh, hopefully a lot of these young kids are going to buy into Everfluss's kind of system uh, and develop they still have a lot of money to spend so if it's in Gaku or who they go out there and get another big free agent pass rusher, but they have a lot of money to spend. And, and the other thing, it's, it's Packers at Bears week one. And so we think that the other schedule quirk of this is it'll be Bears at Packers in week 18. So the Bears will be traveling to the Fozen Tundra uh, that first week of January. Tundra, um, Lambeau, and Lambeau. again, we'll see how, if that plays out. It could be one of those two teams maybe fighting for a playoff spot. Um, we'll, we'll, see where hope, that, we'll see where that ends let's up. Let's hope that team that is is uh, wearing a uh, navy and orange on that day. <laughs> Interesting, though, you, you touched on A.J. Brown for Justin Fields, and it is a copycat league. I've heard you say it before, and we've talked about it. You think about Josh Allen going into his third year. Buffalo went out and picked up Stephon Diggs. So Justin Hurts, or uh, Jalen Hurts, his third year. Eagles went out and picked up A.J. Brown. The Bears, Justin Fields' third year, they went out and picked up D.J. Moore. So you see kind of a pattern there where can we go out and get a big-name quarterback or a big-name wide receiver to help those young quarterbacks really develop. It worked extremely well with both the Bills and Eagles. Yeah, and the Bears also, you're you're losing David Montgomery, who was – healthy not healthy um, we saw Khalil Herbert um, in the in the second running back position always kind of the same thing healthy not healthy um, they bring in Dante Foreman um, who was the running back for the Panthers a, a much bigger running back a guy that can really kind of uh, pound at the goal line so I think that while it's a it's a tough to switch from Montgomery who we saw a lot of success I still think the two-headed monster that they have now in Foreman and Herbert it plays a good key I, role I beg to differ. in that backfield is a three-headed monster because they drafted Rashawn Johnson, who was the backup uh, to Robinson at Texas. So this kid could have started for probably any school in the country, was the backup, but was an all-purpose guy. He came in as a high school quarterback. He played really well in that system. He got the tough, ugly yards. He can pass block. He can receive. He can play on third downs. And he is really, really tough to get down. So I think you've got three good backs there. So you've got a lot of the weapons in place. This is by far the best kind of surrounding cast that Justin Fields has had since he's been the Bears quarterback. Yep. No, hopefully, like I said, they were last, dead last in passing offense. I think they were over 500 yards behind the Falcons and 700 yards behind the Titans. So the Bears have a lot of work to do in their passing game. So we've touched on what we think is, you know, the Thursday night game. Touched on a, a really big NFC North game on Sunday afternoon. Now we're going to jump to Monday night football. And I know we made a little bit of reference to a certain number 12, who's now a number 8 um, and they throw him right into the fire. Monday night football, first Monday night, kicks off the season. The Buffalo Bills travel to play the New York Jets. Well, I don't know how 
you can get any more excited for a, a, a you know the first opening Monday night. I used to love when we had the the, the two Monday night games. Oh, me too. Um, we'd have the four o'clock start. That's week seven two, maybe. But. but I mean, this is this is awesome, and we're going to see a lot of Aaron Rodgers on national TV. We're going to see a lot of the Jets, uh, and deservedly so, despite the fact that they really struggled last year. They do have a very very good defense, uh, one of the best defenses in the league. And now you add Rodgers to this um, in, in what is a good running back with Brees Hall and a good wide receiver core. Um, they should be able to go win uh, and potentially make some playoffs. Now, the Jets are the longest-running professional sports team to not make the playoffs. It's been 12 years since the Jets have made the playoffs. So big expectations on Rodgers coming in there. Um, the Jets do have some confidence. Talk about the Bills. We it, saw them. It was the Sacramento Kings That was the, the NBA. Longest. Now it's the Jets. We, we saw the Bills in, in uh, opening week last year on the Thursday night that go to L.A., and they absolutely destroyed the Rams on the opening night game last year. So they'll play again the opening Monday night game this year. Uh, but it's a team that the Jets are not intimidated by the Bills. Obviously a, a divisional foe, um, but they split with them last year. The Jets beat them 20-17 to at home and then lost 20-12 to on the road. So the Bills didn't put up a lot of points on them. Sauce Gardner able to play a good job of covering those guys in the backfield, not allowing Josh Allen to throw for a bunch of points, whether that was White or Wilson at quarterback with the Jets. Jets. So if Rodgers can be capable and do some things that those other guys weren't able to do, this could leapfrog the Jets. But the expectations are sky high. Sky high. And, and again, shooting out of the box on a Monday night opener against the Bills is going to really tell us very quickly where this Jets team is at. First, before we talk anymore, I just want to say, sorry, Pomp, one of our hub traders about the, the Jets being the team with the longest drought in the playoffs. Uh, just wanted to show you a little bit of love, give you a, you know, a, a shout out there, but uh, the Kings were able to make the postseason this year, so it's really up to the Jets. I think when you look at the, the Bills, too, I love the, the draft of Dalton Kincaid because he's a guy that they don't envision as a tight end with Dawson Knox. They envision him as a slot guy who's going to create a lot of problems um, in, the, in the secondary and with linebackers. So I think you give Josh Allen just another weapon there. Yeah, and, and we know where we talked about, again, the Thursday night and, and the Monday night with the Chiefs and the Bills, the two teams, the, the, the class of the AFC, really don't see anything changing there. I think those are the two teams that sit at the top of the AFC, and it's just a matter of uh, coming out and executing. But I think this is a, this is a tough game for the Bills because um, that, uh, that Meadowlands is going to be absolutely a lot rocking like they've never seen before on that opening well, Monday night. When you talk about the Jets, though, too, and again, we're, we're taping this, guys, before the actual schedule show comes out. But there's been a lot of kind of leaks and chatter that there's three primetime games so far that the Jets have gotten. All three are at home. They play the game that we've referenced. They play, I think it's week four on Thursday Night Football at home against the Chiefs. And on that first Black Friday game on Amazon, first Black Friday game ever, they host the Miami Dolphins. So like Rodgers or not, at least right now the schedule makers, it appears, have been really favorable with giving him three big kind of primetime games all at home. Well, I think deservingly so. We're going to see a little bit of a switch in the primetime viewing that we're used to seeing. Um, talk about Tom Brady, and we used to see Brady on a number of primetime games, whether it was with the Patriots or the Bucks. And I think we're going to see a tapering off of the Tampa and New England in the primetime games. Um, and you're going to see other teams right. fill in these holes. So as the league changes and the, and the primetime players are gone, you you see these teams fill in. And obviously, when we talk about a team that's coming out of nowhere like Detroit and, and these young kids that are coming up, they become the new faces of, of, of the league, that we're going to see them in the primetime games. So now we're going to fast forward a little bit. So you look at in October, October 8th, you've got Cowboys and 49ers playing on a primetime game. And you look at the Cowboys, and, and the East has a very tough schedule um, just based on the competition there at the top. And I think you look at the Niners, and I know we've heard some positive things about Brock Purdy, but there's still a major question mark for me at quarterback. I think you look at the skill position players, and they're phenomenal. You look at their defense, you know, one of the best in the league, if not the best in the league. But there's going to be a lot of tape out now on Brock Purdy. He's coming back from the injury. Trey Lance has shown he hasn't been able to stay healthy. He really hasn't played a full season now in over three years because he didn't play that last year uh, with COVID, because of the COVID. He opted out um, in college. And you signed Sam Darnold, who's on his third team in three years. So there's a major question mark for me at quarterback for San Francisco. And I think there's a lot of pressure on the Cowboys now to see if Prescott can take him to the next level. I'll start with Dallas. And you, you, you hit the nail on the head, I think, with the Cowboys. It all comes down to which Dak das Prescott are we going to see. Um, he led the league with 15 interceptions right. um, last year, um, really because 
C.D. Lamb, to me, was the only guy that he could really go to uh, with the ball, just didn't have that secondary receiver, had Dalton Schultz as the tight end, uh, but we didn't see the other receivers step up around him. They bring in Brandon Cooks from Houston. Um, and so and a, more of a healthy Michael Gallup this year, too. Yeah, Michael Gallup was coming, right. probably pushed him in a little right. bit too fast. Um, obviously, uh, Dallas takes the departure from Ezekiel yeah. Elliott. Um, and so this does this become a, a passing team? first or is it still Pollard they had Deuce and then, Vaughn though yeah, you know, add, add, but again that's yeah, another guy that's right. going to be more of a passing right. attack for them um, but they've got to be, in, Dak's got to be improved for Dallas to improve and for me I've got the, the 49ers circled you, there's a lot of question marks at the quarterback position, there was question marks last year once uh, Trey Lance took over, got injured, Garoppolo came in, right. Garoppolo gets hurt, Purdy comes in and really it was once they traded for Christian McCaffrey. I believe they got him in week seven. He didn't practice the whole week. They went and got killed by at home by the Chiefs. And then from then on, they went and won 10 straight games. And right. they looked like the class of the NFL. And then unfortunately for them, winning two playoff games, and then they go and get drilled by the Eagles in the game where Purdy goes down and, and hurts his arm. But to me, listening to the chatter on the 49ers and the 49ers press corps and the 49ers players. Um, you talk about teams that have a chip on their shoulder. I think the 49ers have like four chips on their shoulder. I mean, this this team is loaded with offensive talent, whether it's McCaffrey and Mitchell in the backfield, um, Ayuk, Samuel, Kittle, Jennings, their defense is absolutely loaded back. Um, this is a team that was, you know, 13 and four last year. Um, and, and, I, and I think once they answer that question at quarterback, like you said, they've got a, a bunch of different right. guys to go to, and they're hoping that it can be Purdy that they go to. Uh, but hopefully they have those questions answered. This is the Sunday night football game on October 8th. But I really, really look for this Niner team um, to, again, by the time we're talking about December and January football, this will be a team that is the, at the top, uh, top one or two. There's another team I, I you got to love in the NFC, but one or two. Um, these are, these are the top teams in the NFC. And my guess is, and I, I know we both think the 49ers are really good, Jay, is that we're going to be rooting for whoever they're playing just about every week, even with the quarterback question marks right now. For sure. And, again, you get, you get the West Coast bias, but that's what happens when you have teams that do what they're supposed to do. They win games. They cover games. They're an exciting team to watch. And I really think when they added Christian McCaffrey last year, we've seen Shanahan for several years use just a – a three-headed monster, and you didn't know what was going on in that in that Niner backfield. And now we do know now that Elijah Mitchell will be back there. Right. But but make no mistake, this is Christian McCaffrey's uh, backfield, and they and they're just loaded with so much talent around him that if he can stay healthy and they can find a quarterback that can just be uh, you know adequate uh, and, and be a quarterback, they're going to do some good things. I know they hope it's pretty. It depends if he stays healthy or not. Now we're going to jump to Christmas a little bit and. The Raiders and Chiefs play on Christmas Day. Um, when you look at the Raiders, when you look at the AFC West right now, their win totals around seven and a half. They're the fourth seeded team in that division. We know how good the Chargers are. We know the Chiefs are the defending champs. We know there's a big coaching change that went on in Denver. And can Russell Wilson elevate? But their win total is a full win more than what the Raiders are right now. So the Las Vegas Raiders sit at seven and a half. They bring in Jimmy, Jimmy Garoppolo. Did they do enough in the offseason? to kind of elevate and be more competitive in that division. Well, I think the odds are kind of speaking for themselves <laughs> and the prices are speaking for themselves as to what bookmakers think and what you know where they're at. I, I think they're fourth in, in the division. Right. I, I don't know that they've done enough. I don't know if they're um, you know waiting for, for something to happen or, or if Jacobs and, and Devontae Adams can be all that for them and, and Jimmy Garoppolo can go lead this team. Um, I just think they're still sitting where they're where they're at, and they're going to have to play over their heads, much like we saw two years ago, to be able to make the playoffs. Right. And and again, this is Christmas Day, um, Raiders at Chiefs. Again, a very difficult um, ask for a, for a Raider right. team to travel to Kansas City um, in the cold, or what we expect to be be cold as we sit in December. Let alone to play the Chiefs in that type of holiday situation. There is another. Can, uh, Christmas Day game that's been released, um, Giants at Eagles. Great game. Um, so we've seen Santa get thro snowballs thrown at him um, in Philadelphia before. And so the Eagles, uh, again, who, who I expect to be the class of the NFC, uh, but if there's ever a time where 
uh, you, we could see some snowballs be chucked at Santa. It would be if the Giants can go in there and beat the Eagles, maybe Santa uh, can get a little bit in a, in a snow you know, fight. They played three times last year. The Eagles beat them both times in the regular season, beat them badly in the postseason. So uh, we'll see what happens. Um, you know, but we setting up Christmas Day, the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the betting public is going to be there heavy um, Chiefs and Eagles. And, right. I, and I, I'm not sure what the third game on Christmas night is scheduled yet, but I can see the two-team parlay is essentially already uh, being written. Yep. Chiefs, Chiefs <clears> and Eagles. <throat> There's a lot of other great primetime games that we haven't touched on. There's a whole schedule of international games as well that are going to be this year, games in Germany uh, as well. So it's kind of cool with all the different kind of stuff that's kind of being leaked out right now. And again, this is before the actual show comes out, but it's fun to kind of dive into this and talk about it. Even when you look at, like, teams with the toughest schedule this year, they it is dominated by both the NFC East and the AFC East, and that's because you look at each division, and you can make a case that there's at least three teams in each division that are going to make the playoffs and could make a serious run. Um, there's also one kind of quirky schedule anomaly uh, in the NFC East, and that's with the New York Giants. So I think it's the first time since 1990 or 91 they play seven of their first ten games on the road. Uh, so if they're able to at least probably be maybe, you know, at 500 at that point, they, oh, they're they going to be at home the whole second half of the season really could make a big difference for them for a postseason push. Yeah, and, I, you know, the international games, I thought there was some interesting uh, kind of quirks in the international game. Uh, Jaguars get two international games. We'll actually spend back-to-back weeks in London um, hosting the Falcons um, in week four. Are and they then the London Jags? The London Jags, yeah. they'll be for those two weeks. They host the Falcons in week four, October 1st, and then the Bills will come uh, into London uh, and be the home team against the Jaguars on October 8th. Um, so the Jaguars will be overseas uh, for those two weeks. Um, so I don't know where their bye week is, but I sure hope for their sake their bye week is then – um, in week six, I think after it would the two have weeks to be, in London. Right. But if it's not, circle week six uh, to maybe play against the Jaguars. I also thought it was weird that the Falcons are playing the Jaguars, and we're going to see Calvin Ridley, obviously who didn't play last year and was a Falcon, who's been picked up by the Jaguars. Um, he doesn't have to go um, to back to Atlanta <laughs> and not, not at home, but he'll get to uh, face his old mates in, in London. Um, and then we do have two German game uh, games in Germany, in Frankfurt, right. Germany, where the Dolphins will take on the Chiefs and the Colts will take on the Patriots uh, down in Germany. No, no game down in Mexico this year, but again, it should, it should be interesting to see what a game is like in Germany. And I think all of those games, all the international games, will again be in, at, in the 6.30 hour for us here uh, Pacific time in Las Vegas. So again, uh, five weeks. Uh, actually, it's, I think it's six. No, it's five weeks that we'll have that 6.30 in the morning game. So um, we're going to have to set the alarm to be here in the book probably by 5 o'clock in the morning. Sounds uh, good to so, me. Some early word morning. Any more reason why you need to get on the STN Sports app to start planning for your early 6.30 in the morning <laughs> um, European games uh, this year. This, As this you year. can tell, we're not excited about <laughs> football season at all, you know. It was a little bit of a teaser with the draft, but <clears throat> this really sets the stage. Um, and, you know, we also – we have the Black Friday game, which is right, going to yeah. be incredibly new this year. Dolphins, we normally Jets. have the, the three right. uh, Thanksgiving Day games. Friday after Thanksgiving is normally a ton of college football with about 20 college right. football games on the board. Um, and, and it's a big weekend, that Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, with all the football that's going on. And now you're going to add the Dolphins and Jets to that Friday schedule. Um, so it's really going to make that right. Thanksgiving weekend even that much more interesting. There's a lot of the other teasers out there, and we'll be able to kind of dive in next week maybe once the schedule is out and really go through, like, the marquee matchups. But talked about last year, week one, Monday Night Football. What did they do? They sent Russell Wilson to Seattle. This year, Monday Night Football, first one, they've got Buffalo to play at the Jets and Aaron Rodgers. There's also kind of a rumbling right now that week 10, and there was that big trade with the Chicago Bears traded with the Panthers, the number one overall pick uh, for the Panthers to have the right to draft Bryce Young, and they would play week 10 in Chicago, Panthers-Bears. So there's a lot of kind of teasers, interesting tidbits out there, and some really great matchups. It's so early now. We look at all these teams, and you know you can make a case that we think all these teams are good, but until they actually step on the field and start playing, we're not exactly sure how it's going to work out. Yeah, and one of the big things for, for us behind the counter as this schedule comes out is really to work on um, our over-under season wins. Right. Um, we've got the conf- you know the odds for the Super Bowl up, the odds for the conference, odds for division, um, and now one of the next things we'll be hanging is over-under season wins. And 
got an idea of where we're at on each team. We've done all the work, but now some of the, the, the little, the little right. work is some of the fine tuning goes into what is this team playing on the road against this team? What time of year right. are they playing on the road against this team? So when you talk about a Giants... How many time zones and travel? Yeah, um, right. When you talk about a Giants team that's now coming out with seven of their first ten games on the road, that, that's tough. That's a, that's a really tough schedule to look at and, and say how are the Giants going to react to that. So that's something that you may see a tweak down in right. that over-under season wins. Um, so I believe they don't play, Jay, a Sunday afternoon game at home until like October 8th. I mean, so it, it's, it's just a strange quirk in the schedule that we haven't seen for quite some time. Yeah, so just look for those things. We, we, we go through our schedule. We've got a, a, you know power ratings and a percentage to win each game and what, what line we would have that game. And some of those just tweak a little bit, and then that goes into maybe tweaking a team or two in their over-under season wins. Maybe it's down a half a win or just a little bit of a money line on a team going down uh, from that standpoint. The one I did want to go back to week one. One of the games that we believe in week one um, is Jaguars and Colts. It's not a game that... Not a game that jumps off the board at you that you maybe want to bet Jaguars and Colts at week one, especially with the Colts. Um, Gardner, Gardner Minshew, probably their starter. Don't know if Anthony Richardson is going right. to be their starter in week one. Um, but I do want to, did want to go back and, and let you know that it's important to watch this game or at least understand the results of the Jaguars and Colts in week one because it's been five straight years that these two teams split their season, their their two season right. uh, games. Um, obviously, they're both in the South. They play each other twice a year, but for five straight years, they split their their game. So, whoever wins this opening week one, you've got a, a lock in the second time they match up um, in playing the other side on the money line. This is just a little teaser, guy. Not a teaser card. Just a little teaser right now because we can't wait for the entire schedule to be released so we can kind of you know put a lot more stuff up, kind of dive into these games a little bit more, but it's exciting. I mean, if you're a football fan, I always say the draft kind of starts the season, followed by the, the schedule show, and then you kind of dive right into it and have some fun. Yeah, and we'll, we'll be right back. We're going to have a little bit of fun talking about who we think from a draft standpoint is going to make the most immediate impact as we go into this year's season from those draft picks. All right, we'll be right back on bookends, and we'll finish it up with you know, what kind of an impact did the draft have, positive and negative, for some teams. Hey there, my name's Stephen Money, and here's why you should bet on me, the SCN Sports app. These are my best buds here at Station Casinos, like my friend Jimmy here, and he'll help you get on me. Wait, that sounded weird. Cut. It only takes a few minutes to sign up. Just park at any of our 14 convenient sign-up locations, walk in, and you'll be signed up in minutes. And don't worry, I got all your favorite sports covered and a lot of betting options. So what are you waiting for? Download the STN Sports app today and trust the local favorite. Hey guys, we're back for the final segment of Bookends. I know we touched on uh, the NFL schedule show and some of the key games that we thought were gonna, uh, are going to be interesting and we had some fun with it. But now we're going to backtrack a little bit. We know the draft was a few weeks ago. And what teams really kind of helped themselves with the draft and what teams kind of hurt themselves a little bit? Um, to me, the teams that helped themselves, Jay, were, were the Eagles, the Texans, um, and the Seahawks. So I love the Seahawks draft. You think about those young receivers and you add JSN. You think about the division they play in with the quarterbacks, you add Weatherspoon. Uh, you end up losing Rashad Penny, you add Zach Charbonneau. I think they help themselves a lot. I think the Seahawks team is much better. The Eagles, of course, getting Jalen Carter, the draft that they had overall, making the trade for DeAndre Swift. And the last team for me really is the Texans. I still think the Texans, with drafting Young and drafting Anderson in that division, help themselves a lot. Yeah, and I I, I, when we talk about impact players, guys that are going to impact their teams this year, and I'm, I'm staying away from um, Stroud and Young and Richards. Clearly, if they get on the field, they're going to have an impact on their team. But these guys that were drafted in the, in the top five uh, of the overall draft. And for me, when I look at this, I, I've got three defensive guys and two guys on the offensive side of the football um, that I think dr dramatic – impacts to their team um, because of the needs of the team now you meant without talking to you previous to this you said the Eagles and Texans with what they did my, my number one impact was was what the Eagles did right. and, and strangely enough they didn't do it with just one guy they did it with two guys um, Eagles with a number three overall defense in the NFL 
number one against the pass, number 17 against the run. And what do you do? What do you go do? You go draft with the number ninth pick, Jalen Carter, a defensive tackle, probably the best run stopper in all of college football. He was projected to, shore, to be the first pick in the draft. Yep, to, to shore up what is the number 17 defense on the team that played in the Super Bowl and drafted, you know, deep in the draft. And then you go draft outside linebacker Nolan Smith from Georgia and their number one defense. And so what the Eagles did for me just just leapfrogs them and, and what they have talent wise and what they're already accomplishing to add two players of this caliber to your defense um it, they're they're just at the top of the class and in the DeAndre nfc and swift in the trade on draft yeah i day. mean and, and you go look at what they've done we're talking about you know philadelphia slash georgia bulldogs right and and how they're building that team um you know through the georgia bulldogs but to get jalen carter number nine to move up um, to be able to do that, and then to essentially steal Nolan Smith with the 30th right. pick in the draft. I think that those two guys have major impacts on a team that's already, you know, one of our top three teams uh, from a Super Bowl favorite standpoint. I'll jump down to stay with the defensive guys um, to number two, Will Anderson. Obviously, a guy gets drafted number two, he should definitely make an impact on his team. Right. But when we talk about a guy getting drafted number two uh, as a linebacker that's going to be able to get a pass rush <laughs> and some pressure for the Texans, the Texans were also the worst defensive rush team in all of football, allowing over 170 yards a game to the team rushing the football. So Will Anderson, I think, is a huge pick. We all saw what he could do at Alabama, but I think that this at least – dramatically improves that Texans right. rush defense. I think he has a huge impact uh, for them starting out this season. And then another guy that you know, a lot of people aren't even probably even not even going to recognize the name um, but Christian Gonzalez was drafted right. 17th. He's a cornerback out of Oregon um, and he goes to the Patriots. Patriots were the number 17th ranked pass defense but again again now we, we talked about it Aaron Rodgers is coming in in a division where you're gonna have to play him twice we know that they've already played the Bills twice with Josh Allen and Tua Tagovailoa and Miami and their passing game and in, in general you have to be able to stop the pass in the National Football League so I think that's a huge pick for the Pats Gonzalez I think has an immediate impact on the defensive side of the football for the Patriots being able to stop the pass and two other guys that I think on the offensive side of the football we saw last year the wide receiver rookie class and the number of expectations put on guys Olave and, and, and Jamison and all these guys and who panned out and do, who didn't. Uh, but I think two guys, particularly two wide receivers that are going into good spots, um, drafted number 22, Zay Flowers, wide receiver out of Boston College, who's going to Baltimore. Um, We've got a rejuvenated Lamar Jackson, um, who, who's after pouting for half a season and, and now getting his contract, who's hopefully going to come back to Baltimore. He's got Odell Beckham Jr. there, um, Rashard Bateman there. Um, obviously, he's going to have Mark, Wilson Aguilar. Um, right. Mark An Andrews back at tight end. But Bateman's coming off an injury. Odell Beckham's obviously coming off an injury. Zay Flowers, I think, can be a special player for them running the slot routes, running the short routes, especially Lamar Jackson gets in trouble with those underneath routes. I think Fla Zay right. Flowers can be a guy that makes an immediate impact. And then probably even more of an immediate impact than, than Zay Flowers, a guy that I'll rank ahead of him, we'll call it in the in your fantasy drafts, maybe a guy that you're, you're looking to go get, was drafted after Zay Flowers is Jordan Addison for the Minnesota Vikings. Um, was, was a star at Pittsburgh, went to USC, had a decent year at USC, but finds himself in one of the best positions for a rookie wide receiver. Gets drafted by the Vikings, going to start opposite uh, Jefferson, and Adam uh, Thaleen's gone. And so there's an open hole there. K.J. Osborne most likely to stay in the slot right. number three position. He's going to get a chance to start at the number two wide receiver position uh, for the Vikings playing indoors. I think Jordan Addison is a guy that can put up 60, 70 catches in that number two spot uh, for the Vikings. I think JSN, too, um, going to Seattle with, with Metcalf and Lockett, it really opens things up for Geno Smith. I think you had two dynamic wide receivers. Now you have three. I still think in that division, we know the Niners, we talked about them, how good they are. But I think there's a serious drop-off then from the Seahawks to the Cards and Rams. And the Cards and Rams are two of the teams that, that we raise the odds on. I think they're both in kind of full rebuilds. And I don't expect them to be competitive, I think, which really opens the door for the Seahawks. The other team, the Commanders we raised, I think you look in the NFC East and how good are the Cowboys, you know, the, the Giants, the Eagles. I think the Commanders are, are below them. And then in the uh, AFC North, you look at, uh, or in the AFC South, you look at the Titans. I think uh, 
the other teams really, I think, improved a lot. We know how good the Jags are. They finished the year strong last year. They get Ridley. Both the Titans and Colts, at, or both the Colts and Texans, had young quarterbacks and helped themselves on defense. We know the Titans do the same thing with Will Levis, but I think they're still fourth in that division. We raise them somewhat as well. Yeah, I, I look for the Jags. Uh, you know, as, as the leaps that the leap that they made last year, and you know, if you go back two years ago. Um, you know, I, I was not a, a, a favorable guy for Trevor Lawrence. I wouldn't say that I was a huge fan of Trevor Lawrence. Um, but the, the transition to Peterson right. down there as a head coach um, really made a difference for him down there. Um, really a viable offense that they have going. Now you add Calvin Ridley. If Calvin Ridley can come back as 75% of the guy that he was with the Matt Ryan Atlanta Falcons era, the Jacksonville Jaguars and Trevor Lawrence are in for a big year because they've got a great receiving core, ETN, and again, they're going to have to score a bunch of points because the defense is not outstanding. Uh, but look for big things for the Jaguars. From so a fantasy year. perspective, Lawrence is a guy definitely should be on. Yeah, the you're radar. you're you're seeing Lawrence, uh, you know, skyrocket up those right. quarterback draft boards, much like uh, Justin Fields. And you know, you talked about Seattle. Um, I still think the, the loss of Penny um, and, and uh, Walker being the running back there. And now the three-headed monster. But they at do add Charbonnet. Yeah, they've yeah. got. But again, he's a guy that they you want to have get catches out of the right. backfield. Um, you know, is Geno Smith a viable fantasy quarterback with with that three-headed monster? I, think he has to I just be. don't know if, if Smith Majigma becomes that guy right away. He's still got to leapfrog and fight for targets. But, uh, yeah, but with, it doesn't have to with, be that guy because you have Metcalf and Lock. Well, but I mean, if you if you're looking from him from a fantasy, fantasy standpoint. Right, yeah. And, and, and you're going to be thinking, can he? Can I find a way to get 60, 70 receptions and 700 yards and, uh, you know, six or seven touchdowns? Just don't know if he's there because those other two are going to command the ball. But what it throws in the mix is now is Geno Smith a guy that you can draft with confidence because he does have that three-headed monster I think and he, some good guys out of the backfield. I think he almost has to be. And, and I, I always thought, you know, when he went there, he was just going to be a, a stopgap until they could find the next quarterback. But I believe statistically last year he put up more touchdown passes than Wilson ever did in a single season. So, like him or not, I mean, he still has the big arm. He's got the big weapons. They play in a division that's a high-scoring division. So I expect him to throw a ton. Yeah, the, the, the Chargers... Uh, another one, you know, we, we talk about Allen and Williams, and it seems like every year one of those two guys is out in a game. And they, they drafted the clone. Yeah, they don't they don't play in a game right. uh, together, and now they get Johnson. And so, just from a standpoint of they have a three headed another big monster wide out, to, right. to go to now. Uh, again, is that is that moving uh, them up the the, right. the quarterback draft board as well? We do have a couple of rookie props on the board as well, so uh, check those out, guys. And again, this is all kind of prior to the schedule release show. But we'll be adding some more stuff on the board, and uh, we'll be talking about the impact and some more of these key games in the weeks to come um, on bookend. So as Jay mentioned, don't forget, what a great time to get signed up for SDN Sports. Still a lot going on with both the NBA, NHL playoffs, baseball, a lot of other cool stuff going on as well. You still have uh, two big races in the Triple Crown races coming up in the Preakness and Belmont, not that far away. So get signed up for SDN Sports. It really does bring the race and sports book to yeah, you. Yeah, we're sitting here spending an entire segment on pro football while we've got you know the knights uh you know in, in the playoffs the nba playoffs are, we're about to go to the conference finals and we've got uh some teams playing really really good baseball and some teams playing historically bad baseball um it, it's very possible that the our own oakland slash las vegas athletics set a set a record in baseball for ineptitude I not talk about them but um, as they're, they're winning at a 21 percent clip right now um which you know uh, historically, the worst teams in baseball are, you know, about a 32 to 34 percent clip. So the A's are a full 10 percent worse a stat I than, hear. than the worst teams ever in baseball. And uh, you know, through their 38 games that they're at right now, they're allowing 7.6 runs a game, uh, which is absolutely atrocious. Um, so if you're looking to bet overs, yeah, I was going to. The, gonna, the so A's, Jay has left you guys yeah, with a two-team parlay. Yeah, bet against the A's and over every yeah, game. The, the opponent and the A's and over has been the simple winning formula uh, uh, to follow. So you're laying some big prices, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, you know, it's it's not as much as we talk about Tampa and how great they've started off. The, the season <laughs> in, to start has been about right. the bad and, and how bad. They're not uh, the only team that's Oakland, bad, though. Oakland, Kansas right. City, right. Chicago, 
uh, White Sox and and, and, the, and the Cardinals right um, have just been been really really bad. Uh, Washington's uh, the Nationals have been somewhat of a surprise. Arizona uh, winning winning their yeah. games, but boy, we sure hope Oakland can find a way to win some games. Otherwise, it's going to be a, a real easy season uh, to be uh, making money in baseball. So, <laughs> get the app and bet football. Right. Don't don't bet the, get the this app. Is a football to, show. Don't you guys. get the app to bet baseball. Just. Uh, Hold off on your baseball bets, focus on hockey right. and basketball. So we hope you guys enjoyed our little teaser on the pro football schedule. A lot more stuff to come out. As you can tell, we were super excited about the draft. We're super excited about uh, the schedule show coming out. A lot of good things we'll be putting on the board. For Jason, I'm Chuck. We're here at Racing Sportsbook. Look forward to seeing you guys soon on the next episode of the Sports Betting Podcast. Bookends.